focus of this videotape is going to be on infection control. Hi, I'm Kathy Getrust and I'm an instructor in community health nursing. One of the major goals in healthcare is to prevent the spread of infection called pathogens. Infection control is the effort that we place to prevent the spread of pathogens. There are always going to be harmful germs around us. They never can all be eliminated, but they can be reduced by maintaining certain cleanliness procedures. You will hear the terms clean and dirty being used as it relates to cleanliness procedures. Clean is considered to be a situation with equipment and supplies when they are free of pathogens. Examples might be linen that's on a linen cart or it could be equipment or supplies that are being stored in a clean utility room. Dirty, on the other hand, is considered to be soiled with pathogens. That means that it would be any item that has been taken into a patient room. It could be linens or other supplies or a piece of equipment. Even if the item taken into the patient room has not been used for the patient, it is still considered dirty and can never be taken back out of the patient room for reuse until it has been cleaned with a disinfectant or in the case of linen has been laundered. There are specific guidelines for preventing the transmission of pathogens. These guidelines have been developed by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, more commonly called the CDC. These guidelines were developed in 1995 and consist of two tiers of prevention. The first tier of prevention is called standard precautions. Standard precautions are used when caring for all of your patients. It assumes that all patients are infectious. By adhering to standard precautions, health care workers are protected in all of their interactions. These standard precautions apply to situations in which a caregiver may come in contact with blood, body fluids except for sweat, this could be secretions or excretions such as urine, feces or stool, vomit, semen, or vaginal secretions. It also applies to situations in which a caregiver may come in contact with mucous membranes. Those are the moist linings of the mouth, eyes, nose, and genital area. It also applies when in contact with non-intact skin. Non-intact skin is skin that has been broken or damaged. All caregivers follow certain procedures to prevent the spread of infection. These procedures stress hand washing and the use of personal protective equipment, also just called PPE. The PPE, or personal protective equipment, consists of gloves, gown, mask, goggles, or face shield. Standard precautions for infection control stress the importance of washing hands before and after wearing gloves, when touching blood or body fluids, and always between patient interactions. Also wearing gloves when in contact with blood, body fluids, secretions, excretions, non-intact skin, or mucous membranes. Wearing a gown with procedures that are likely to generate soiling of clothes by exposure to patient's blood or body fluids, draining wounds or other secretions or excretions. 
wearing a mask or eye protection with activities that are likely to generate splashes or sprays of blood or bodily fluids to the eyes, nose, or mouth. Once used, patient care equipment is considered soiled and must be cleaned in a manner that prevents contamination to the caregivers and to other patients and the environment. More specific information about standard precautions will be covered on another videotape. You will also receive extensive training in your orientation to a new facility about standard precautions. The rest of this videotape will be covering information about the second tier of precautions called the transmission-based precautions. These transmission-based precautions are used with patients who are known or suspected to having a contagious disease. An example of a contagious disease might be tuberculosis, pneumonia, or measles. These uh, transmission-based precautions are designed to interrupt the mode of transmission or the way that pathogens are transferred from one person to another. Transmission-based precautions are always considered extra precautions. That means that standard precautions are always used in addition to the transmission-based precautions. Patients with transmission-based precautions are placed in isolation. The isolation environment separates the patient with a contagious illness to keep the spread of infection. The room has to be a private room when at all possible. You can imagine there are some psychological aspects of patients that are placed in isolation. First of all, caregivers can be fearful of someone who has a contagious infection. Likewise, patients and families can be fearful and stressed when in isolation. Not only do they fear the disease condition that requires the isolation, but they also are fearful of the practices that must be followed for these precautions to be effective. For example, the personal protective equipment can look quite scary. Special procedures are needed to be followed for handling the infectious waste material. Restrictions are placed on patient's movement outside the isolation room, making the patient feel like they're being cut off from the rest of the world. There also might be possible restrictions on visiting hours and on the number of visitors that the patient in isolation might receive. They're also fearful about passing that infection that's contagious onto their loved ones. As a re result, these people need an awful lot of emotional support. Some of the ways that you as a caregiver can provide that emotional support is with active listening, spending extra time with the patient, and clarifying questions or any misunderstandings that the patient or family might have about the isolation situation. Any questions that you are unable to answer, be sure to check with the nurse for clarification. Transmission-based precautions, as I said before, are used in addition to standard precautions. The type of transmission-based precautions that are used depends on the way the infectious pathogens are spread. Guidelines for the Centers uh, for Disease Control and Prevention indicate the specific precautions and personal protective equipment that's needed based on how the disease is spread. There are three types of transmission-based precautions. The first is airborne precautions, 
Second, droplet precautions. And third, contact precautions. I will speak about each one of these types of transmission-based precautions individually. Airborne precautions are used for patients with diseases that are transmitted by air currents. For example, tuberculosis, chickenpox, or measles are those type of pathogens. These pathogens are small and light, and they're suspended in the air or on dust particles in the air. They can travel long distances on the air currents or in ventilation systems. All caregivers entering patient room with airborne precautions must wear a special mask. This special mask filters out these uh, small disease producing pathogens, making it safe for you, the caregiver, to work with the patient. Caregivers are specifically and specially fit with a mask that's called a high efficiency particulate air filter mask, or commonly called just a HEPA mask. Droplet precautions is another type of transmission-based precautions. It's used for diseases that are spread by means of large droplets in the air. Examples of that might be influenza, strep throat infections, or pneumonia. Ways that they can spread it are by sneezing, coughing, or simply talking. The droplets, however, usually do not travel more than three to four feet from the patient who is infected. The third type of transmission-based precaution is contact precautions. This is used when the infectious pathogen is spread by direct or indirect contact. Direct contact occurs when a caregiver touches a patient directly on a contaminated, contaminated area of the skin, on blood, or other body fluid. An example might be touching blood on a patient's arm without having gloves on. Indirect contact occurs when a caregiver touches an item that has been contaminated with infectious material. An example of that might be touching a used Kleenex or a bedpan, again without the use of gloves. There needs to be careful preparation for isolation. An isolation card indicates which of the three types of transmission-based precaution is necessary and is determined by the physician that's caring for that patient. An appropriate card is placed then on the door entering the patient room for all to see. An isolation cart that uh, houses all of the personal protective equipment is placed outside of the patient room for easy access. A waste basket is placed inside the room with a color-coded liner, always red, so that there can be placement of infectious waste in it. Equipment, supplies, and patient belongings going into the isolation room must be limited. There may be instances when items are taken into an isolation room that it may not be able to be removed and therefore will have to be disposed of. If the item that has been taken into the isolation room is allowed to be removed from the isolation room, it will have to receive some very special and specific type of disinfection. The rest of this tape will demonstrate how to put on and take off all of these pieces of personal protective equipment so that you as a caregiver can become an effective member of the infection control team. Putting on gloves. First, wash your hands. Pick up the glove by the cuff 
and put it on the other hand. Repeat with the glove for the opposite hand. Interlace the fingers to adjust the gloves on your hands. Removing gloves. Grasp the outside of the glove near the cuff of the non-dominant hand with the glove dominant hand. Pull the glove off the hand inside out over the fingers. Hold the glove in the palm of the gloved hand. Insert fingers of the ungloved hand under the cuff of the remaining glove. Pull the glove off the hand and over the glove that's in the palm of the hand. Throw the gloves in the waste basket and don't forget to wash your hands. Putting on a gown and mask. Remove rings and watch. Put on a mask, face shield, or goggles if needed. Pinch the metal strip at the bridge of the nose. Pull the mask securely under the chin. Put on the gown with the opening in the back. Secure the neckties or tapes in the back. Overlap the gown edges so that clothes are completely covered by the gown and tie the waist ties. Put on gloves securely tucking in the cuffs of the sleeves. Removing the gown and mask. Remove the gloves and wash your hands. Untie the waist ties and loosen up the gown. Wash your hands again. Remove the goggles if they were used. Grasp the mask or face shield by the elastic strap and remove the mask and place it in a waste basket. Untie the neck ties. Drop the gown over the shoulders, pulling the gown away, touching only the inside of the gown. Hold the gown away from the clothing, rolling it up with the dirty side folded inward. Put the rolled up gown into the waste basket or laundry hamper. Wash your hands again. Use a fresh paper towel to open the door. Discard the towel in the wastebasket before leaving the room. Finally, wash your hands after you've left the room and closed the door.